Next up, I'm going to begin the news section. So I'm hoping to do this monthly. It's my goal for this because I do like talking about the news, specifically in areas of my discipline or things similar to it, where I can discuss things that are happening, new innovations, new research, and I, you don't have time to do everything. There's way too much news. I'm not even going to try to do everything. I have a bit of maybe excessive amount uh, today, but in the future I'll probably try to have a few things from each topic I want to try and cover. But this one's going to be the environment. So we'll get started here with a very straightforward topic. Okay, now in this first one, reading cleaner air boosts the U.S. corn and soybean yields. So specifically, this is an analysis of air pollution, and it's compared to the production of corn and soybeans in the American Midwest. It shows that lower air pollution specifically resulted in higher yields of about 20% of the product. So by lowering the air pollution, you help the farmers to grow more food, and it doesn't damage them as much as it normally would. Now to do this, they use satellites, they analyze the finer concentrations of excuse, ozone, particulate matter, nitrogen dioxide, and sulfur dioxide. They also found that a further distance a farm was located from a power plant, the greater its crop yields. Thus, if you're further away from the pollution, you're not as affected by the pollution here. And unfortunately, it's very likely that it affects the plants. It affects us, obviously. But once again, this is how science needs to approach things from an interdisciplinary uh, viewpoint. You can't think of your discipline as separated into just your discipline. They had to use satellites to analyze the pollution present over farms. This is multiple disciplines working together. And I wanted to point this out because people often overlook how one field can help another field. Uh, not so much scientists as more ordinary people who don't understand how these uh, different disciplines connect to each other. But it is important to show this. <coughs> and of course, always, you're going to see more information on this. But showing alone that it's helping is a clear indicator that it's just better for the environment. Next up, this one's a bit interesting because I was unaware that this existed, and I would like to see more of this. <clears throat> uh, vertical turbines can be the future for wind farms. Now, what they're talking about here is wind energy. So, firstly, wind turbines are a source of alternative energy meant to be healthier and more sustainable than fossil fuel burning plants. However, there's a question on which direction they should point. Researchers here conducted a study on vertical wind turbines. They move circularly from left to right, not up and down. And they determined they're more efficient than the horizontal wind turbines that we all see. And they also increase each other's performance when they place them next to each other. As they're spinning, they generate force, and that wind continues turning other turbines, which turn other turbines, turbines turning turbines. And I'll show you the difference here. And I think I've seen something similar to this before. I've never seen this exact design. And there's a few different ones. I'm sure that they have the prototypes and different things they work on. This one you can see would spin round and around. Here, this one's a giant uh, kind of teardrop shape, but it would spin from left to right as opposed to up and down, as the ones that we have now spin. And this is a comparison from left to right. You can see these two different types of turbines. They call them uh, the HAWT for this version, and then the lower VAWT for the uh, vertical one. That's the only difference, horizontal or vertical. It is a bit interesting how different they are. So they were trying to see maybe we should redesign wind turbines. Maybe this would be more effective. 
<laughs> and the studies, they need some better names. This is the numerical modeling and optimization of vertical axis wind turbine pairs, a scale up approach. Ah, oh, interesting. Oh, it's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Ooh, we have an abstract. I would like to see your high res imaging. Okay. That said high res, right? Well, anyway, this is the turbines they have in mind. And they made a sea farm, because once again, I think it's at sea the wind is much stronger. There's no obstructions, but I could be wrong with that as well. They're all uh, vertical. They're turning left to right. They are all close to the sea as well, but they aid in the turning from each other because they're pushing each other with all the wind they generate and all the force that pushes into each turbine. All right. Now, in the next section, this is just a little bit different, but it's all environment, so don't worry. Uh, this is going to talk about zero waste. Okay. And if you don't know what that is, it's bit, I'll give a, a very simple introduction to this. The goal of zero waste is to reduce the amount of waste generated from daily activities as much as possible. They use reusable bags and glass jars for their products, which are meant to prevent the use of plastic reduce the use of plastic, which of course is a petroleum product, so it's based in oil. You have to dig for oil to use them. Uh, it, it, but it's beyond that. It's also reduce the use of paper or styrofoam or other materials which you have to keep producing constantly. And in this case, reuse the items that you're making, the food or the hygiene products, in, and put them into containers and then bring them back and refill them, don't throw things away. So the idea is uh, refill, clean, refill. Not buy, uh, use, throw away, buy, use, throw away. It's refilling clean. That's the key idea here. And I won't go into much detail because most zero waste stores are the same thing over and over, but I want to introduce the basic idea. You buy things in bulk, take them home, clean them, come back, refill, over and over again. But I do like showing all the new ones, and hopefully one day, if someone's watching this in their neighborhood where they're living, you can go to one of these stores because they open everywhere. There are so many of them. I think the number I've seen so far is 30 in globally across the world. But this one is, I had to look this up actually. This is the Anglo-Celt, if you want to guess where this is from. But this is place is located in Cavan, Ireland, and it's called EcoShack, and they started this business here in their zero waste shop, and of course ads. But you can see that you can buy things in bulk. These you pull levers, food comes out. They have jars and everything to be able to be reusing things as much as possible. This is another store. This one is located in Midland, Michigan, in the United States, and it's called Phil. It's a little bit different, though. Their goal is to use zero waste solely for personal hygiene products. So in this case, we're talking about uh, soaps, toothpastes, uh, lotions, cleaners, things that you can use at home, but not food products. <coughs> so it's a bit more uh, specialized. This one is from, got to be careful because it's not Australia. It looks like Australia, not Australia. It's an Australian-based company. It's in Toronto, Canada, and it's called Source Bulk Foods, but it does much of the same thing. As you can see here, lots of different containers. You can scoop things, and primarily they use glass jars. You can bring them yourself, doesn't matter, but you scoop them in, they want you to use reusable bags. That's why these are here. But it's a chain one. So they have plenty of different locations. This is just one. There's plenty others. And it's from Australia. There's also other zero waste stores in Australia too. All right. Moving to a slightly different topic. Let's talk about human composting. Now, this story was from Oregon, 
because the governor of Oregon has legalized the practice of human composting in her state. It opens a new environmentally friendly alternative to those who wish to see the remains of their lo uh, loved ones used a bit differently. Now, everyone knows about the burials. With the, oh, uh, either in the ground, you can cremate people. There's sea burials occasionally. However, this is a different alternative. And there are two versions of this. The one you can see, I believe, yes, this one involves actual composting in soil so that your body breaks down into the soil. But there's also a water-based one called alkaline hydrolysis, which is pretty much the same thing in water. You break down in water or soil, and each one is meant to be environmentally safe. Now, the argument for doing all this is fairly simple. If you have graveyards in a city, it's taking up a lot of space, if you cremate people, you're generating a lot of pollution. But if you compost people, you can allow your dead bodies to be used as fertilizers instead of being sealed in a coffin or burned as pollution. And you can scale the concept up. You can plant people in gardens, put plants over them, and it's a memorial to the person who has died. Or you can make it into public parks and plant other different types of plants over them constantly and you can make a memorial park which can be in the center of town where everybody comes as opposed to isolating it in one specific area and reserving that space permanently because there is a deceased body there you can't put anything on top that's where your gravestone goes as well and i know only some people would be interested in this however it is an alternative you could always consider and it's only legal in a few areas you uh <laughs> Actually, you have to be able to specifically ask for this. You uh, can't necessarily just do it if you want. It's a bit odd, but I guess they have reasons for it. Now, the first one up here, this is Recompose. And what they will do is take your body, and they'll put it in some of this lovely soil here. See? It becomes soil when you die. Death is profound, momentous, and beyond our understanding with an approach that is practical as meaningful. Recompose connects the end of life to the natural world. See, you can become a plant, yay. I don't want a relationship with this. <laughs> All right, so what they do, they put you into uh, soil, they rotate your body for a month, letting it decompose, and then it is ready to be used as compost. Any fillings, prosthetics, or implants that you have can be reused if they are reusable or recycled. Ah, it's so comforting seeing all the plants and everything. Now the other one they have here, this one is aquamation. And they were the other option I mentioned, the alkaline hydrolysis. What they do is they immerse your body in water and then alkaline chemicals slowly break it down and then you can reuse it in whichever way you prefer because it is a type of, uh, not compost, but it can be used in a similar way. But it depends where it's legal and what you can do with this. So I'll show this video over here and they are showing the practice. U.S.-based company Recompose will start the first ever funeral service that turns human bodies into compost soil next year. Setting architects involved in the project, Dezine reports that the flagship facility in Seattle will be capable of housing 75 bodies in its compost. And this is mostly, uh, mostly Western-based in the United States. They mentioned it's Seattle here from Washington. Oregon legalized it. Not that many places have. So it's starting more in this section. But again, Washington State, Oregon State, tons of parks, tons of national parks, forests, very green, beautiful areas, large mountains. Uh, they would be a natural place that you could do this. I don't know about Arizona, but hey, if you want to, it's always an option. Not legally, of course, not in most places, but it could become an option soon. Post vessels. According to Recompose, prosthetics and pacemakers will be removed from the cadaver to prepare the body for the natural organic reduction process. 
Citing company founder Katrina Spade, the Washington Post reports that the vessels accelerate to natural decomposition. According to so, if you have any burial plans, you may want to consider these options. There's more of them, uh, and some of them include uh, composting uh, through mushrooms, I believe. There's, it's a mushroom suit that you can wear, and a variety of other options, too. And now on the straws. Which is such a fun topic to talk about. It, it, it's completely meaningless. It's a minute subject. And people are so energetic about it. Firstly, we're going to talk about replacing plastic straws. Replacing. Now, the plastic straws are produced at a very large rate. There are quite a number of them. Billions. And all you do is use it and throw it away right afterwards. You're putting them in the garbage, they're going into landfills, it's very excessive, it's not environmentally friendly, they don't break down, they can hurt animals. So instead of pollution, we can look at some very uh, excellent replacements to get rid of them. And this is one company which is doing this here. Now, I have a, a whole list of them. There's so many companies doing similar things. But this one, which is called Pasta Straws, it's a very simple idea. Certain forms of pasta look like straws. They function in very similar ways. And the company has a number of things they've done to try and modify it so that it works as a straw. Firstly, it's vegan. It is gluten-free for those who have allergies. And it is a pasta straw, except not quite, because they use rice flour and tapioca starch to strengthen it against the liquids. But at the same time, uh, there's not too many allergies with these ingredients, so it is a bit safe. The straws here are compostable. They should break down. And they also naturally dye the straws as well, so the colors come from. This way it's not artificial. It's not uh, involving chemicals. And they did say they're produced in Southeast Asia. They don't include much information about this. But these are very uh, acceptable al alternatives when it comes to choosing between a plastic straw and these types of pasta straws. And something which is often not mentioned very much about the straws is that you have to farm to get ingredients for the straws. So instead of directing money towards uh, digging for oil, producing plastic products, you can direct money towards farmers because they'll be paid for producing more food, in this case, rice, which then can be turned into the straws. But it's a more environmentally friendly method than just producing plastic straws. And in a similar note, coming up here, this is a very uh, interesting invention from Japan. I, I've seen this before, but I'm not sure how often I've seen it. And this is, a, again, an easy concept. Instead of having capsule tea or coffee, Coca-Cola Japan has created cubes, single-use cubes, which can be instant tea or coffee. And the idea is that it reduces waste, because if you've seen them in stores, there's instant packages they're very small, you can pour them into water. But again, it's little plastic packages, and you throw them out again. This way it reduces on waste, they're not individually wrapped. You pull one out, throw it in, and the bags here are made from paper. So it's at least more environmentally friendly, and you can recycle this than if you just use plastic, which, again, you would throw away. All right, and that finishes all the environmental news. If you have something similar, you can always share it below. I'm interested in finding uh, more unique solutions, especially environmentally friendly solutions to replace the ones that really are not and can harm the environment.